I wonder if you can just carry that in your pocket yeah. somehow. Yeah. I don't know how to do this. Yeah. So it's recording already? Yep. Okay. And just have to chop off all this nonsense. Nothing. No worries. I'll put it here then. Sack. Yeah, it's going to be right. That's fine. Oh, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm happy to, uh, that this is a nice coincidence that we're celebrating World Environment Day, I find out this morning, so it's quite exciting, and we can reflect on that during the talk. Um, I just want to anecdotally mention, and I was mentioning to Lena just before, that, that this work actually started, was sparked by the grassland installation that Linda and John and others did at the State Library five years ago, almost five years ago, uh, which is you know, time flies, right? And now I'm here all this time after having the pleasure to talk to you about it, Linda and John here in the room and all you. So yeah, just bear in mind how slow some, some time things are. Um, what I would like to do, and, and thanks Terry for mentioning about the photos, is I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you four, four of my photos just for you to reflect on and maybe think World Environment Day while you're doing it, but, but really just try to get lost, get lost in them and, and we'll come back to, to that later. So I'm going to start that now, and I'm going to give you four photos, starting with that one that you've already been seeing for a bit. It's the next one. And last one. <clears throat> Excellent. All right, so let's have like a shared discussion to break the ice a little bit. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering, of course, what did you think about this? What brought your attention when you looked at these photos? Uh, I wish I could ask you each one independently, but let's just play with our hands. Did anyone thought, think about pollination? Yeah, excellent. That's. But what about invasion ecology? A few people. Okay, we'll get back to each photo let, that we have the time to to actually talk about things. What about indigenous culture? We just did an acknowledgement to country. And I'm asking you whether those photos in any way reminded you of our local Aboriginal culture. 
Excellent. Not, not many, but at least some. Uh, what about plant pollinator interactions? Yeah, was, that's very, very obvious. Excellent. Uh, what about yellow and black patterns? Yeah, was, that was so obvious, right? Yeah, like strikingly obvious. <laughs> good. All right, good. So before I start a lot, of, I want to definitely do something different today and then go back to the photos. So yeah, here we have a native insect, a native pollinator on a native plant. I'm assuming a little bit of a botanical background, so I'm going to play with that. I'm assuming that everyone knows that this is a local indigenous Asteraceae, and here's a native bee full of pollen. So all those concepts of interaction. Um, but for me, this brings indigenous culture immediately. Like, I think that if you're thinking about local Aboriginal culture, these species have been here forever, right? And I think it could relate to that kind of culture. That's why that, that item was, was there. Now, this one is a slightly different one. The same type of native bee interacting what, what we will call this plant. Is it too bold to call it a weed? Introduce, naturalize, what is it? It's definitely not local, but definitely not indigenous. Definitely not, it was definitely not here when Aboriginal people were here before a settlement, right? So that's something different going on. What about this one? And I'll tell you a secret. This was taken right here about three years ago, right here in the Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. Anyone recognize the plant as like a non-native plant, I hope? Right? I don't know exactly from where, maybe South Africa or something similar. What about the bee? Does this bee strike as obviously non-native to everyone? This is a recent introduction of a South African carter bee that somehow managed to get to Australia uh, and has been working its way down to Victoria. And now it's sort of a common site at places where South African plants are common. So the Tony Gardens and other places like Ripon Lee, for example, at Glenera and other places. So there you go, this is a non-native on a non-native. How strange is that, right? And what about this? Then going back to your classical honeybee that we all recognize as a classical bee, but it's a non-native. And does everyone recognize the banksia here? Like the banksia flower? We're right into a banksia, right? So this is a honeybee interacting with a local indigenous plant species. Um, so good, so I hope all the themes come back, right? Like pollination, invasion ecology, both on plants and insects, indigenous culture, both on plants and insects, and then obviously plant inter interactions, which are at the core of, of the photos, and, and obviously the black and yellow patterns. Excellent, so I like the next few slides are just gonna be a very brief, brief theory of like what I think theoretically when, when I talk about these, you know, like what do I see beyond in these photos that goes back to like ecological theory? So one of the things, that strikes me as really evident is that urban environments are sort of fragmented and what you get is like islands of vegetation, islands of habitat, like the Botanic Gardens, like Cranbourne, like Royal Park, etc. And so if you had all the species interacting, all the insects interacting with plants across the city, those interactions are going to look different depending on the green space that you are. And so for example, if this was the Botanic Gardens here, then you might get a whole bunch of interactions but then if you move to this little patch here, say a smaller square somewhere in the CBD, uh, say the state library before the grasslands installation, you will get few interactions, right? And so on and so forth. So maybe this is a grassland with more interactions. So this is the core of ecological theory is that interactions and networks of interactions are gonna be different. And then you can kind of summarize the big network in something that we call the meta network. And so this comes back to the idea, here are the four photos again, that the management decisions that we do, the plant species that we decide to plant, are gonna have a different effect on the insects. Because we, we really can't bring back the insects. We cannot just have a whole, but we can, when we do it with hives, that's kind of, yes, but uh, the South African carnaby is an accident. Native bees are just here. We don't really bring them into the site. But we can definitely bring plants into a site. And that's what we do in the Botanic Gardens all the time, right? So like those decisions are gonna reshape these meta networks. And that's exactly what I explained before with the photos. That depending on what you plant, different insects are gonna come. And these insects are gonna be either non-native or native. So for the next slide, I'm gonna concentrate here on this side of the story, the native plant story, and this other plot. This is part of a really interesting research that we've been doing at Westgate Park. We've been following all the pollinators that are attracted to their plant species, and Westgate Park ha happens to be, hope you're familiar with Westgate Park, 
um, where a management is purposely done with indigenous local plants. So some of these names might sound familiar to you, I hope, buttercup, sorksbill, etc. These are all indigenous native plants here. And look how they then create what we spoke before, these interactions with both native insects here in blue, the large majority of them, but a big component also spread within these three non-native insects, the European wasp, the European bee, and the cabbage white. So you get all of this happening, and, but how does this then can help us think about management and how does this all connect back to the pop-up parks? I'll get you to that in a second. I'm going to focus right now on blue banded bees again. Thanks. Uh, I have a few photos to want to show you. So we're going to go zoom in into this little story here. How does this then have to do with us thinking, what could I do to foster blue banded bees? What kind of plants do I need to plant? Can this help us guide those decisions? And so... <clears throat> Here is what I knew, this is kind of like the picture, metaphorically, of what I knew, what most people knew, basically, about blue banded bees, say, a few years ago. It's the story of the blue banded bee connecting to a flax lily, right? Flax lily only flowers around October, November, so like at least the species here in Melbourne that, that I'm aware of. And then you get the idea that you can see blue banded bees if you can see flax lilies, okay? But then after following uh, pollinators and plants in Westgate Park for two years, now we know that after the flax lily goes out of flower, the blue banded bee shifts into other indigenous plants if they're present. And so now we know that, for example, goodenia ovata, the hoop goodenia, and also this beautiful uh, storkspiel attract blue banded bees. So like, there's something that we know more. Like, there's more plants, more options. But now we go to Cranburn, right? And this is a story that Terry was referring to. In Cranburn, you get things like ex situ collections of threatened plant species, in this case this Pyamelia from Western Australia, that happen to also attract our local indigenous Victorian or Melbourne blue banded bees. And there was a really cool interesting thing that we noticed is that this plant actually changes the behavior of the blue banded bee. This is a side story. Somehow there must be some kind of narcotic or something that makes the blue banded bee slow. So normally blue banded bees are super fast fires. But when it gets to this palmelia, they start kind of like becoming slow and clumsy, and you can actually take really good photos because it's, <laughs> so it's almost perfect. <laughs> Go to this patch. Um, and then finally, obviously, blue banded bees are non native plants, in this case, a Chinese plumbago. This photo right here from the Botanic Gardens in the patch. There's a few patches of this plumbago here, and you can go see blue banded bees there. Uh, the fast flying type. Um, so, so anyway, imagine this, and I'll leave it here before going into purple parks. What would a patch in a botanic garden, in your garden, any place in the city will look like if we could combine all the plant species that we know attract blue banded bees, right? They will be flowering all across the year, there will be ex situ collections, there will be non-native plants, there will be the local indigenous plants, and we could have something that actually attracts insects. That's a different story, right? It's like starting to think, can we manage for insects as well through the plants? And I see a parallelism here with pop-up parks and grasslands and other type of installations where we're actually actively seeking to bring plants into the city. We can also do it for insects. So on that note, I want to move into uh, the contribution then that pop-up parks can make to bringing nature back into cities. And when we say nature, it's not only plant nature, but insect nature, and with that, reptiles and birds and everything else. Um, we we're very lucky that, we, as I said, we've been working on this paper for almost four, half, four and a half, five years, and really timely, it was published on Monday, just before the talk. So I was really excited that I know I wanted to talk about this, and I was really optimistic, and the paper came out, and now it's all, it's all happening, so it's really good. Now, what are pop-up parks? I know that a few of you definitely know what a pop-up park is, but does, is everyone familiar with a pop-up park? Has everyone, has everyone been to a pop-up park? Let's get a sense of that. Yeah? Okay, a few of us have been to pop-up parks. We had to come up with a definition for the paper, and we just basically said, it's a small temporary green space. As easy as that, right? So you have other types of green spaces that are small but not temporary. You have other types of parks that are temporary and large, which is your normal park. So a pop-up park is basically, yeah, a small temporary green space. Now, how temporary? <clears throat> and, and sorry, I want to say something about this photo. We had to research what was the first pop-up park. Can we find which, whatever happened that someone came up with the term and actually did one? And it happens to be that this, this photo is the first 
pop-up park ever in the 1970s in San Francisco. So this brilliant woman female artist decided to have a pop-up park under a bridge. She removed all the rubble and all the rubbish, brought back some plants, put on some benches, even brought back a few uh, little farm animals here. Right? Can you see them? A little donkey or something? Uh, and then created this movement, the pop-up parks. So this was picked up much later by a group, another uh, like studio called Rebar in San Francisco again, kind of picking up on that vibe. And they decided to go to a parking space. Isn't this cool? And they deposit the coins, so they rent it, they lease the parking spot. It's theirs, right? But they don't park a car. They park a pop-up park. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? So right there, you know, they parked it for two hours because that's how much money you can get. And so that's how temporary pop-up park can be. This started in like tw uh, 10, 15 years ago, 25. So, uh, and it's, it's a world movement. There were over 1,500 pop-up parks from this one day in November that they call the parking day happening all across, across the world. Uh, I haven't had the pleasure, but has anyone been to a parking day pop-up park? No? Maybe next, next November here in Melbourne, we could, we could all go. All right, so like <clears throat> in our paper, we had to review the kind of things that people suspected could be good about pop-up parks. Uh, so like we learned that pop-up parks might attract people individually. So it's more about your own mental restoration, sitting down, reconnecting with nature. Uh, yeah, just chilling out and having a space where nature is present in the city. It's also about socializing and kind of thinking, well, I'm used to nature, right? But I don't find it around me in the city. So if you find a pop-up park, even temporarily, you can there sit down and, and reconnect uh, with your partner and relax. But it's also about socializing. It's a big, big important component of the social benefits of pop-up parks. And um, so we wrote in the study initially that there were no studies in the world that were studying the social benefits of pop-up parks. Luckily, as things go in science and in peer review, the editor of the journal got back to us with the one example. So there's the one group of scientists who did study the social benefits of Popo Park, and, and now we know about it. And their major finding was that people who use Popo Parks tend to not use their phones at the same time. So less screen time, less looking at Facebook, less chatting on, on, you know, on Skyping. They're actually socializing in the middle of the city. That's a really, really cool finding that, that we report. And as you can see, these parks are mostly from, from the US. So this is another example in Williamsburg that is more about the plants, thinking about what kind of plants they want to grow there, even if it's temporary during the site construction. And bringing it home, an example of a pop-up park, that then turns out that it starts like a pop-up park and it ends up being a permanent park. So this is a phenomenon that's happening too. Pop-up parks can kind of like trigger that necessity of, of a green space and then somehow convince people who make the decisions to make it happen. So the Outback at Square at RMIT started as a pop-up park, a big investment, temporary, and there was supposed to be this massive building built here that now is not, technically, it's not going to happen anymore and the park is going to stay. So that's really good. And then finally, and really recently, I hope some of you heard about the Living Pavilion. The Living Pavilion was definitely inspired by the Grasslands installation, as you will see in a second. And there was the idea of being able to bring a whole bunch of indigenous plants into a site, into the Melbourne campus, the University of Melbourne campus. But there was, it was a company, it was with a whole series of art science events. It was a really beautiful um, sort of like happening that took place for about three weeks recently. Did anyone went to the Living Pavilion? Yeah, okay. Yeah, excellent. Good. So, yeah, and here's just a photo to show you that their approach to the plants was quite different. The plants were like sort of in the young stage, and it was more about showing a whole bunch of diversity of plants as opposed to showing like a coherent mature grassland. But anyway, it was, it was really interesting. So I was lucky to do research a part of this that is actually the follow-up research of the pop-up park that I'm going to show you today. And that maybe, hopefully, will not take five years <laughs> to publish. All right, so another impressive female artist, Linda Tegg, present right here. I'm really happy that, that you're here, Linda. Uh, had this idea of having the grassland at the State Library of Victoria, and that's the one that we're going to focus the next couple of, of slides on um, to show you kind of good things that we could find. So here's the grassland Look from above. This is the State Library of Victoria that you're familiar with. I just want to show you this so you get a sense of how densely urban matrix this site is, right? So it's kind of like the closest thing here will be Carlton Gardens 
and this little site here, Argyll Square, University Square, and then at the other side of the river, Bayerung Mar. So it's a really, really dense area, and we have to keep that in mind when you think, when we talk about the insects that we found here, because one of the key things that we don't really know is where these insects came from. Did they came from Carlton Gardens? Did they came with the plants? Uh, I'll be, get back to that in a second. This slide shows that very clearly. And then it's like zooming in just to get you a really sense of where this grassland was. So what's here are the four court steps. And so basically our science was designed in kind of showing that the insects that came here to the grassland were different than the ones that came, I'm pointing here, to sort of the permanent tree shrub species present at this site. And it was, it's very modular in design. It was a really clever design. Um, you know, the basic unit was a planter crate, sort of rectangular. They were all aggregated together. Um, and then all of these form some kind of eye lines in the step library. So it's, it was really beautiful. People could sit here amongst the islands of vegetation. And, but when you combine them, it's only about 130 square meters of vegetation, which is not crazily to think that we could do this more often in cities, right? Bring 100 square meters of plants uh, into, into a particular very densely urban area. And the whole idea then, this is key, right? Was to bring back the native grasslands that would normally use to be there at that site. Okay, and so some of you are more familiar than probably I and, and with these plant species, but I just wanted to show that obviously you had grassland type poaceae, so grass type species like kangaroo and wallaby grass, but also a whole bunch of four flowering plants like these goodenia and rutaceae and stilidaceae here uh, that obviously then attract pollinators and butterflies and other things. But it's just a really good attempt at recreating the grasslands uh, with a whole bunch of indigenous plant species. Uh, the only boring slide without photos, research questions, so bear with me. We needed to ask them. So um, first thing, of course, is was it enough time? Keeping in mind that the grassland only lasted for five weeks. Is that enough time for the insects to come? That's the first immediate question. Uh, can they come? Um, then, of course, some, of, some people point out, well, maybe they were already there, as I was saying before, but let's think for now that they were attracted to the grasslands. And if they are, are these insects different from the permanent vegetation insects that were there before? Is it just that, that the permanent things are jumping to the grassland, or are they different things? And we, we're going to show what we found in a second. So these are our two research questions. And this one is just to show you a little bit of, of like, so you can think conceptually of what we did. So here you have your permanent in green, your permanent vegetation. Uh, we're mostly focusing on the ornamental beds, not the lawn. And then the grassland installation vegetation. And we managed to go one time per week. So we have five different full-on pictures of the community of insect and spiders that went to these two different types of vegetation. And obviously, then the question becomes just a comparison. I'll show you what we found. Imagine that you didn't have the grasslands, and we know exactly what kind of insects and spiders were there at the state library. And then imagine that you could then magically add the grassland community and see whether it's different, right? If they're exactly the same insects, these two things are going to look exactly the same. But if for any chance they're different, there's going to be a whole bunch of new species that were attracted because of the grassland. And this is what we find. I hope there's no surprises here. It makes it really interesting. Permanent vegetation, 49 species of insects and spiders. Okay? In the grassland, 70 species. So that immediately means that there were more insects in the grassland installation. But now let's look at how many of them were unique. So in the permanent vegetation, there were 40% unique species. So, okay, you can say, well, like, this is, is it worth protecting? Yes, they're 48% of unique species. But the grassland had up to almost 60% of unique insect species. So those are species that only occurred at the grassland during the time the grassland was there. And obviously, this all adds up to um, 90 species total insect and spiders that were present during the grassland. So it's quite easy to say that you went from a site that only had about 50 species to a site that had 90 species, and that different is the contribution of the grassland. 
And this is our main finding plot. So um, we separated, just for a little bit of description, all this insect and spider species into functional groups to make it more interesting, as opposed to talking about each species independently. So these are things that everyone can recognize, things like pollinators, herbivores, predators, parasitoids, which are a specialized type of wasp, and detritivores, basically consuming uh, sort of like organic material that it might be dead or alive. And so flies and mostly other things. And then all combined. And so you can easily see here that in green, remember that, that scheme of color, green is your base permanent vegetation. So this is how it looks. So let's say you go to the State Library of Victoria a week before the grassland, and you might find about seven pollinator species. But if you go to the State Library of Victoria during the grassland, you find over 20. So this is the power of the grassland installation to attract pollinators to a site. Um, and then you can see how that pattern repeats across all the functional groups, herbivores, predators, parasitoids, detritivores, and of course all of them together. And here you can see what I was talking before, that you had about 40 odd species when the permanent vegetation was there, but up to 90 when the grassland was there. And another way of looking at this is kind of like the, the factor of change. So like it's, it's pretty impressive. So you have four more time pollinators, et cetera, three more times predators. And sort of an average, you have three more time insects species. So this is diversity, just not numbers, diversity of insects while the grassland was there. And so, yeah, this is my takeaway message for us to reflect on. I believe that pop-up parks can definitely contribute to bring nature back into the city. And it's, it's not only about the plants that you bring back, but it's about the other things that come back, insects. And we don't even know what the effect on birds and other things could have been or could be. So, thank you very much. Uh, that's fantastic. So, uh, we've got some time for some questions. Anyone got any questions? Burning questions? Yeah. yeah. With the last <coughs> slides, we can have one of us be increased in numbers, etc. Yep. Maybe I'm sorry, absorbing it all, but can you account for the increase um, of insects due to just the sheer increase of vegetation? Yeah, yeah, no, of course. So, well, um, so the permanent vegetation at the State Library was about 12 plant species. Okay, so 12 shrubs and little trees um, and the lawn. And so, and those 50 insect species then obviously live on those 12. So then all of a sudden you bring the grassland with almost 56 new plant species and, and then a whole bunch of abundance of, of vegetation and then you attract all these insects. The real question that we don't know and that we kind of like really uh, carefully discuss in the paper is, I think there's at least three options. One of them is that the insects were already there with the plants. So I think, I believe, don't correct me if I'm mistaken, but these plants were grown at Burnley and the Burnley University of Melbourne campus. Can I just make a comment? Yeah, please. In your paper you say they grow in the, in the greenhouse. Yeah. Just possibly for your information, they were actually outside for... Oh, yeah. So exactly. they actually had a fair bit of time in the field station yeah. at Burnley. So I guess transport is a pretty high yeah. probability. Yeah. yeah, yeah, excellent. So this comes back to the idea that one of the things that now we're discussing as a novel, a novel conceptual thing in ecology might be the idea of incubation that we're calling. So it might be the idea that you could grow plants somewhere with high insect diversity, then the insects will be attracted to your plants growing and then you can transport them in a very clever way to another site. And so therefore you're incubating these insects with the plants already as an option. So we discussed that. Uh, but obviously there's the other option was that the, the insects might have been attracted from the local green spaces into the site because you have new plant resources. So yeah, I think to answer your question, obviously there's a strong effect of what the plants are doing, whether in, because they were a, a soil that attracted insects or whether they had resources that attracted insects from the sites. Yeah. Um, I'm interested in the social benefit of the science yeah. as well. So did you measure any difference 
some social benefit with the increased diversity of experience, or is that not part of your study? I'm just curious. Yeah, so there's two, two answers to that. We did try, and we wrote a really quick, during the time it was all really acting really quickly, we wrote a really quick ethical proposal for the university, and it was approved in time, but really by the time we were out there doing it, the grassland was almost finishing. So we decided to say, okay, we tried, but we're not really going to say that we did social science research at the site, uh, just to be kind of honest to our methods. Um, and so that's why we did the literature review on it, and then eventually found this one paper that had done social science research on pop-up parks. So we didn't do social science directly yet. Yeah, so have you come across any linkage between the diversity, the increase in diversity and increase in benefits, so the qualitative and quantitative? I mean, have you come across that? Because <coughs> a park with more than trees versus other yeah. uh, plant forms to me is a, a different scenario. So. Yeah, no, we would, we would love to. We actually somehow use this research to get a larger grant from the federal government to, to research that, and hopefully that will come up in the next few years. But the one study that we do include in the paper, um, they did something different. They did interception types approach. So they had a bunch of little pop-up parks, I think in Europe, that had already been designed. So they didn't influence the design. So we don't really know exactly how to kind of test for changes in vegetation and different plants. And what they found was that most of the people were socializing, but then also that most of the time that people were engaging with these pop-up parks, they were not using their phones. So that basically means that they saw someone walking down the phone with their street, you know, with the street with their phones, and they saw the pop-up park and they're like, ooh. And so they this so less screen time they call it. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, that's a brilliant question. So I have a colleague, Dave Duncan, who brought this up when I was doing this presentation during a conference. And, and so um, we, we also wrote that in exactly that, that we don't know what happens to the insects after you remove the vegetation. And so in the living pavilion slide that I show was one of the things that we were really careful to do, do different was that we went to the site before the plants came in for like about three weeks, six weeks before. So now we know everything that was there that is not the grassland itself, the new gra the living pavilion grasses, uh, but from before and then during, and then we're also gonna survey after. So I'm actually gonna go on Friday again. And so for this new follow-up study, we're gonna find out whether some of the insects then remain at the site or were they all gone? We don't know, it's really interesting. Yeah. Please. Uh, I, I'll have my, my version and then I might uh, consult, but I understand that really kindly some of the plants were given to the public on the spot. So some of the plants were given to people, which I found really beautiful. And then I also know that some of the plants were then permanently planted at Royal Park uh, under like close to a beautiful uh, gum tree. And I went to see the site about two years ago and it's a very beautiful, and for me, the most beautiful example of a grassland in the city of Melbourne to date. So it's there and it's very beautiful. Yeah. I'm glad you know that. Yeah, please. <laughs> I, I should have brought a photo of it. Yeah, it's, it really remained the spirit of the grassland. You can go there and there's all these pollinators and it's, it's very di different. It's some kind of management that we should all be looking, striving for. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah, so yeah, we described three potential pathways for pop-up parks, one of them being they can be seasonal, so I suppose, so like if you know you have a patch that normally has a use but only part of, part of the year, then you can use pop-up parks to fill out that role and bring nature to that patch at least seasonally, so that's, that's a good use. And obviously the other, the other option is for it to become sort of a pathway for something to become permanent, as the Abbeckett Square example. So they started saying that they had the most, I think at some point RMIT was bragging that they had the most expensive pop-up park ever in the world, right? Um, and that it was all temporary and you know, for all the benefit of the students, but eventually there's gonna be a big building built there. 
and the pressure was so high to to keep the pop-up park that eventually one of those pathways that we discussed eventu eventuated. So now it's permanent. So I think it's a really good tool if you're kind of seeking to a permanent space to start with a pop-up park. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, please. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, of course. Um, so this is like a sort of big question. <laughs> Please. So, say in a scenario where the insects or this diversity of insects comes in with the plants from the burning fields, mm. um, and we, and then in that situation we're saying that these pop-up parts have a benefit. In that particular scenario, who's benefiting? <laughs> anyway, I mean, this is not a criticism, it's just a big question. Because, say, those insects are getting transplanted to another context. But you could say maybe there's an urban ecology that benefits from those insects coming into an urban space, perhaps. Or is that maybe a different benefit if they didn't come in from the field station but came from a nearby area because they're benefiting from this increased um, pollinators and flowers and food and um, disease. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe with an example, like I, I've been asked a lot of times, I use pollination quite loosely for a lot of people and I get criticized for saying even right here, I might be criticized by saying that I attracted or that I show that pollinators were increased at the site because for some, for some pollination actually means demonstrating the actual act of pollination. And so if you're a scientist and you're not demonstrating that, you're actually not working with pollinators, so you should be referring to as you're working with flower, you know, insects that are attracted to flowers, for example. So for me, like this whole thing is, it's more like a pathway. What you really want to show is that at one side of the story, you have the human who observes the insect on a flower and derives benefits from that. As in, I just observed pollination happening and that is rewarding for people that that brings connects people with nature it's demonstrated that observing biodiversity engaging with biodiversity brings uh, you know, health and well-being benefits to people so what about the yeah. sex or, or just the sort of diversity or that ecology I and mean, could we say that having more insects in a park in an urban setting is i mean maybe you have to that has to be measured or something because does it allow on, um, in sort of pure numbers more insects, say, and that's a good thing? Or is it just transplanting them? Or, you know, displacing them? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. So there's a really clear uh, relationship, a beneficial, a positive relationship with diversity in general of, of insects, birds, spiders, just of animal species and plant species and ecosystem functionality translate that into pollination services, pest control, um, human social benefits. So that connection is it's really strong and it's at the core of ecological science and conservation science is to demonstrate the benefit of increased biodiversity and increased ecological functioning. Um, and so and that's been demonstrated many, many times. Uh, so yeah, like I think it's safe to say that if you can attract insects to a site as the beginning of the whole trophic cascade of different animals that need to be in a place for things to work, uh, that you're definitely deriving ecological benefit from it for the whole ecosystem, for the whole picture. Mm. They're food for, for birds, for example, so even, even that could be a good thing uh, you know, when they act as food for other animals. Thank you. Yeah. So there's not 90 species at a small park like, like that, I think. So, so a site like the Botanic Gardens here, we you know, massive diversity. Yeah. Like, what sort of scale are we talking about? 90 species there compared to what you might find in a large urban... Uh, yeah. Place? Oh, no, that's an excellent question. So um, just following up on the, on the grassland, um, which happened in October of 2014, during 2015, we did a really comprehensive study using the same methodology across most, if not all, of the major green parks in the city of Melbourne including the Botanic Gardens. Um, and so when we summarize that information, I could show you the same, the same type of plot like here, 
and then the number here will be about 560. So then, like across the whole city of Melbourne, following the same approach, you will find almost 600 insects. And at one point in the State Library during the grasslands installation, there were 90 of these. So I think it's, it's quite impressive. It's not trivial. It's not 90 against 10,000. It's 90 against almost 600. So it, it's really powerful. Yeah. Yeah, so, but unfortunately, we don't have the numbers for the Botanic Gardens because we never got to uh, look at that data. It's something that I'm still trying to hope to get some, some money to do eventually, some funding one day. Yeah. <laughs> Roger? Has, has anybody done research as to just how many species blue band of bees will visit? Has anybody done just that? Is there a list? <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I appreciate that question because I've been interested in doing that list for a bit now. So, um, so yeah, I've been documenting really carefully all the plant species that attract blue banded bees in Victoria and Melbourne and in different places. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that uh, every time you find new species. So it's not to say that a blue banded bee is a generalist, but it's definitely adapting to non-native plant species. So um, there's a whole range, like salvias, for example, that blue banded bees love. And you, you all probably have examples of where you have seen the blue banded bee that would contribute to this list. So yeah, there were blue bees that had them on conosaurus and the end of the race, little tiny yellow oh, yeah. uh, things like that, Italian leaves, um, West Drinking. Yeah, West right. So and with just a very small garden. Yeah. It's amazing what they come into. Yeah. So maybe a follow-up comment is that um, as part of other research that, that my colleagues and I are doing, we're trying to then dig a little bit more carefully into what, how we can classify plants from the management perspective. So like, uh, and so what we did is sort of move from here, that plot that I show you with the four, I'm just gonna bring it up. Uh, like here we take a sort of like a very naive approach and we just classify things really like non-native, native as in if that's the only approach. And, and we're trying to go more into, okay, a plant that is fully on locally indigenous, so meaning it's from the local bioregion in Melbourne to a plant that might be from Victoria, but not from the bioregion. And there's a few examples of those. There's definitely examples of plants that are native to Australia, but do not occur naturally in this bioregion in Melbourne. So with Strinky, I think there are a few examples and Lophostemon and other, other things that are common and naturalized perhaps here in the city because of management. And then obviously you have non-natives with a full range of, of options, right? It could be non-native from China, but non-native from Africa. So there's a distance and a, and a kind of like a dimension there. And then on the other side, it's not the same to say that you have, say, uh, a, a lawn type grass versus an erect type grass versus a shrub or a tree um, or a climber. So we're trying to get a full sense of what kind of combinations work. Um, what we're finding, not surprisingly, by looking at that data more carefully with this 560 insect data set that we have from the city, is that a little peak of what we are finding is that indigenous grasses are the winners. And it's not surprising given what we're showing for the state library. So that kind of piqued our interest. And so we now know, if you ask me, what should I plant to attract insects? I'll say plant an indigenous uh, grass, a tosaki type grass like Themida. Big winner. <laughs> that's without the wild type of plant, it just as a, as a species in its own right. It is highly attractive, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. How many species of grasses do they have in the library grassland? Is it just one or two species, or do they have a whole variety? Oh, I wish I could have the full list here. So, well, no, definitely more than one. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah? <laughs> Five? Five? Six or seven. Six or seven? Yeah. And a couple of lilies as well. Yeah. <laughs> and you have, can you tell the example of it? A very weedy native grass that, yeah. that came into the production stage, which, which was there unintentionally. But, but, but it was native, but it was, it was quite weedy within that. Um, but uh, yeah, so they're probably six or seven. Or yeah. Which one was well, the dominant well, one? Well, that, that's grouping the quality grasses as a group. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we, um, so the seminar, so the kangaroo grass. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Delanaki, yeah. Oh, sorry, how you pronounce that again? I was trying.
trying to <laughs> have a, how would you pronounce that in my mind before coming today? All right, I'll get back to you. Yeah. I knew that Femida and Ritula Sperma, but the, that third one, I was like, there's no way I'll say that in public. <laughs> This one, yeah. And the standard grass name too, and, and typical grass plants, so some of them are more abundant than yeah. as individual plants than you respect. Uh, yeah, so like, as I said, like, when I would like, be part of the research team for the Living Pavilion, and I knew that they were going to bring all these plants to, to a site again, I got really excited, but obviously then you can imagine the day that the plants arrived and I saw that they were in the immature stage and they were very different. So I thought, okay, something, we're going to find something very different here. Um, and that the role of the age of the plant and the maturity of the community, even if it's designed, will play a, will play a critical role in, in these insects coming. We still found a lot of good, good material to work with, but it's not going to be ever as, as what we found in the grasslands. So that age really determines. Yeah. Question in the back? Okay, yeah, thanks. So I, I guess I'm just going to try to rephrase the question. So you're wondering how different like uh, the uh, insect community and the composition of its different functional groups are in a purely remnant grassland as opposed to what we found here in the city? Uh, yeah, well, I really, I would love to know the answer to that, but I just really don't know. It's not, I don't think it's been studied in that kind of like systematic way where we could actually know. And it obviously would add a very interesting dimension to any future research if you could then do a grassland, a purely kind of natural native grassland, and then study one that happens here. But as we study more grasslands that are brought to cities, then we'll probably get, could get a better picture. But at this stage, I wouldn't know. Yes, thanks. Oh yeah, good, thanks. Well, um, so we do know a little bit about that. So parking day, this parking day that I mentioned is definitely the winner. That movement attracts thousands of pop-up parks on a specific day in November, I think is, and maybe if someone knows, I think it's maybe November, or it's, it's definitely one day. Um, and so that's definitely something that we know. Councils are really keen on pop-up parks. And so mostly I have thousands, well, hundreds of examples in the US, for example, uh, that councils that take on community initiatives to develop pop-up parks. Uh, and then again, some of them become permanent and some of them just go away. Um, but yeah, I was Googling pop-up parks intensively uh, during the last week. And it's incredibly the amount of new pop-up parks initiatives that have popped up since, say, five years ago. So I think it's definitely a movement that is picking up. Uh, hmm. Yeah, I found it brilliant, this idea of just take these parks and, and like make it a park, even temporary. I guess there's a lot of effort in developing a pop-up park too, so I can see there is some really strong motivation to do these. Um, so we'll have to see where the trade-off is between motivation and actual results for people in the long term. They seem to be doing well so far. Lois, um, extending the, the parking area just a little bit, sometime in the last 25 years, I can't remember if you did a student actually coated his VW with, with the fabric into which have been growing plants yeah. and, and then drove it around the, around the city. So we could actually have a mobile. <laughs> a mobile one. <laughs> yeah. 
and I heard, I heard ideas, very serious ideas of doing um, edible bus stops, for example. Like, and basically, I think nowadays, greening will, like, I think people will green anything uh, about everything, which I think is great, like, to explore the possibilities of what could be green and, and whatnot. I particularly love that idea. All right. I think we'll let Lewis go, and uh, so if we could have a lovely round of applause. <laughs> uh, sorry, can I have one more minute, if everyone? Um, sorry, guys. Since you're here, I want to like I want to try to um, ask you for a favor. I'm, I'm doing this other research that is about animal attractiveness of all things. So I'm also interested to see like why, and it comes back to the blue banded bee question. Why am I so fascinated with the blue banded bee? I don't know what it is, but since five years ago when I got to Australia, I'm like, it's just, is it the blue colors? Is it because it's fast? And I think that everyone somehow is fascinated by animals for different reasons. So let's run it for example here. Um, who prefers the red insect to your, to your right than to the bird? And so I'm guessing that everyone else prefers the bird, yeah? All right, so there must be something driving that, right? And, and so we're trying to find out so if you go to this website that we have developed, publicelicitation.org, uh, there's a very cool survey that is trying to, to tease this question. And it's all about photos, and it's really simple and really fun. Um, so have a go, and, and hopefully one day uh, I'll hear from you, and we'll find out what is, what is it about animals that our people find more attractive than others. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you.